Hello and welcome to the Vedic Conversation, where each episode we take a different topic and look at it through the lens of storytelling and from the perspective of the Veda, an ancient but still very relevant body of knowledge from India. I'm Anthony Thompson, a Vedic meditation teacher based in London, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues, Rory Kinsella in Sydney and Derek Yanford in New York. This episode was recorded during the height of the lockdown, and we're talking about the power of silence and what it can mean for your life if you can find a way to integrate it. But first, sit back and listen to our stories, and then we'll dive into the conversation. And don't forget to stick around until the end, where we'll offer a practical exercise in how you can apply this knowledge to your daily life. When I was a teenager and started to go out with my mates, we'd often go to house parties at people's places when their parents were away. You know, typical naughty teenagers. And we'd each somehow get hold of a four pack of beer and find a stupid hat to wear and rock up to the party fashionably late, of course. And for a while there was this song that we really liked and we'd take it wherever we went. Someone had it on a, on a cassette single which shows you how 90s it was. And whenever we'd arrive, we'd put it, put it on, you know, to make a bit of an, an entrance. And the song is called Cannonball by a band called The Breeders. And it's this super simple two chord grungy punk track that has this crazy energy to it. And we'd pile into the main room of the party, which was usually the lounge, and stop whatever was playing on the stereo, which was, you know, usually one of those little MIDI hi-fi systems with the two tape decks and we'd put our tape in to announce our arrival. And the song starts with this big sliding bass line on its own that goes ding 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 and we'd all spread out and strike poses around the lounge with our cowboy hats or whatever was the craze that week. And then the song would kick in and we'd mosh around the lounge knocking into people, knocking things over and basically taking the whole energy of the party up to the next level. And then about two minutes into the song there's this break before the second chorus. And it's only a couple of seconds, but two full seconds in the middle of all this noise and pogoing and headbanging was really quite something. And it's one of my favorite bits of the song, the silence. You know, it's all about to kick back in, but it's not quite yet there yet. It's all pure anticipation, pure potential. And then it drops and then drinks would fly everywhere and we'd get on with the night, making sure to re retrieve the tape for the next party. And I'm sure you've noticed this in other songs. It's a very popular device in many musical styles, especially in types of dance music where the DJ will take the fader and it will, will add in extra bits of silence on top of the ones that are already in the records. And it's this on and off that provides contrast and makes you appreciate the music more. It's the silence that gives power to what comes after it and what precedes it. And I found this when I've been making music myself too. I play bass and I'm often tempted to play, you know, all the way through a song so I have something to do apart from anything else. But it can be much more powerful to drop instruments in and out. So if I leave the bass out for a few bars or even for a whole verse, it's so much more noticeable when it comes back in. It's kind of like, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Or how, you know, at the moment being trapped in this pandemic makes us appreciate being outside and socialising with people more. And it's also this mechanic that we build into our lives with a regular meditation practice. We engage in dynamic activity and then we rest. We turn our senses on to the delights of the outside world and then we close our eyes and turn our awareness inwards. We move forwards and then we stop and refuel and then we move forwards again. And it's the breaks that give us the energy and vigour to keep going and the clarity of thought to make sure we're going in the right direction. When I was a young dance teacher, I often found myself preaching to my class and over explaining the ideas I was trying to convey. And becoming older and wiser, I incorporated the power of silence, speaking much less but meaning much more, and finding 
just the right words to say and weaving silence into my speech. I found the less I spoke, the more impact I had. Now, great musicians understand the importance of weaving silence into their music, as silence gives the, the listener the opportunity to absorb, digest, and reflect on the beauty of the notes and the sounds that were heard. Silence is also used as a way to contrast the rhythmic phrases and the melodic harmonies that a beautifully composed piece of music contains. Now, the beauty of silence is that it is the thing that is always there. It is not created. It is constant. Noise is what's created, and it's noises that are added on top of silence that we are often hearing or being entertained by, where essentially silence is being drowned out. So it's not that we ever add silence to something, but more accurately, we simply remove that which has been layered on top to reveal silence. Now, how is this relevant in our life? is that the world today has become oversaturated with sound, noise, distractions, and stimulus that would have us believe silence is something the likes of fiction. Yet inside of us, we each possess a silence, a quietude that is ever present. But engaging in the activity of our daily lives, it can become difficult to find, rendering most of us strangers to silence. Fortunately, through the practice of Vedic meditation, we position ourselves to experience this inner silence but by removing the layers of noise that sit on top largely in the forms of our thoughts. And the uniqueness to Vedic meditation is its use of a bija mantra, a meaningless word or sound, one that the mind finds charming that draws our awareness away from the surface or gross level of thinking downward to the subtler, less noisy thoughts below with the possibility of completely transcending thought altogether, whereby as a byproduct, the mind falls silent. Now experiencing silence allows us to move inward, closer to the truth of who we are, to the truth of being. The truth the Vedas refer to as pure consciousness, which is all that exists and that you are it. And when we spend time with our inner silence, the experience of this truth begins to express itself outwardly, creating an altogether different dynamic that reflects the duality of our inner and outer worlds, bringing forth an integration of both the absolute and the relative. And this provides a richer life experience as we become able to detect silence and subtlety where we previously thought there was none. Now, during this pandemic, where we're forced to stay indoors and distance from others, many of us have found other virtual ways of communing, likely adding even more screen time to our already device-driven lives. So the question then becomes, in what capacity are you experiencing your inner silence? If you never give yourself the opportunity to be still and consistently choose distraction over connecting with your inner silence, you run the risk of missing out on the brilliance and the beauty that lies within you. Now, in terms of getting the most out of these unprecedented times, make sure to favor rest, relaxation, and stillness ahead of an alternate form of stimulus. Your inner silence is waiting for you. There's a small country village not far from London where I sometimes go and stay. Nestled on the side of a heavily wooded hill, it's a beautiful place at any time of the year, with a pub, church, games field, and village hall, quintessentially English. The ambient sound is very different to that of London. Lots of bird song, including chickens and cockerels, lawnmowers and strimmers, the occasional shout from the cricket pitch in the summer as someone's bowled out, children laughing and playing games. 
Sometimes when people from London move into a village like this, they find the background noise disturbing because it's so different, even to the point that they take out an injunction on the church to prevent it from ringing its bells. Wherever we are, we're used to our soundscape, the layers of ambient noise that surround us, our neighbours coming and going, the clamour of the commute, the office hustle, street noise, the swish of traffic, sirens, planes overhead. I'm sure you've noticed a difference in your soundscape since lockdown's been in place, noisy birdsong perhaps, or quieter homes, sounds that seem more intermittent and spread out, less regular, less familiar, which can be disturbing for some. People are using this time to develop all sorts of skills, ranging from learning how to bake bread to painting pictures. But how much time is spent developing internal skills, such as learning to be quiet, holding the silence within? Silence can be disconcerting for many people, particularly in a social situation. It makes them feel awkward and they want to break it. We have a great opportunity now to spend more time in silence, withdrawing ourselves into a quieter space, somewhere within, where what we hear is more pertinent, more relevant and sustainable, the truth. When we meditate, we give ourselves the opportunity of disengaging from the external clamour and turning our attention inwards to a deep, still, quiet place where there is silence and the absence of thought, which connects us with everything and in the process nourishes us, allowing our evolution and growth to be effortless and enriching. In his Sartor Sartus of 1831, the poet Thomas Carlyle wrote, silence is the element in which great things fashion themselves together, that at length they may emerge full formed and majestic into the light, daylight of life, which they are henceforth to rule. Speech is silver, silence is golden. Speech is of time, silence is of eternity. up in person. I think it's essential that when you come into the room, you're wearing your cowboy hat and you're busting those boots. <laughs> you know, I want to see that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, don't know where that, I don't know where it went. I have to go and get a new one. You know, it's like you go to those parties and you probably only wear a hat for five minutes and then someone steals it and it just becomes a nice part of the fun. <laughs> but I really enjoyed remembering back to those days <clears throat> and yeah I guess similarly to you Derek you picked the example of music and because I play music I was like right I want to want to talk about music because it's it's everyone knows about this powerful relationship of silence in music and I was just trying to think of an example of a specific song and I went through all these lists of um, songs I think there, there was like a Rolling Stone article on the power pause in music. And there are, there are quite a few different songs. I was trying to think about examples of songs that I've really had a relationship with. And, you know, there were quite a few rock songs that I've, of bands that I like. And then Cannonball came up and I was just like, oh yeah, and I hadn't thought about that song for so long. Cause I guess it's very of, of that era. You know, Derek, you were saying you remembered it from school and it <clears throat> like it's very like a mid nineties grungy song. And I just remembered that particular period of life because it was in, you know, in the UK, like we, people often start going out around 15, 16, but it's hard to get into the pubs because you've got to be 18 in, in England or supposedly. Um, so we'd often go to these house parties. And I remember that that was such a fun much more fun than when we did start going to pubs because it was, you know, house parties is just, you've got an excuse to talk to anyone who's there because it's, you know, you've got this shared connection of someone's friend's friend's friend. And yeah, just a really great time of life where, you know, you're exploring new things, but yeah, that, that powerful part of the music where it's that, that silence that really um, gives power to the rest of it. And, like I said, it only it's only two seconds, but that's all you need. And I guess that kind of feeds into when I teach people about meditation and I talk about how much of a time investment is, I always talk about how it's only 3% of your day. I think even if you do 20 minutes twice a day, it's only 3% of your day. And that's a tiny sliver of time compared to the, your whole day. 
but that makes such a big impact, like that two seconds of silence in the song before it all comes back in, that that three percent of your time spent in silence just makes gives kind of shape and meaning and flavor to to everything else, which was great. But yeah, Derek, I loved how you also kind of instinctively thought about the music, but how your example was about when you're teaching, it's that kind of idea of less is more. Yeah, I mean, in movement, I think as a choreographer, I, I kind of found the same thing with, with stillness. And when I'm teaching young dancers, like myself when I was young, we often adapt this idea, we have to move as much as possible. The more we move, the more we're saying or the more value it has. And I gently remind my students that as much as dance is the art of moving, it's also the art of not moving. And that stillness kind of plays the same part in dance that silence does in music. And when that pause happens, it gives everybody a moment to reflect or digest the movement that they've just seen before. But I can also see using that same example when you're eating a meal. So if you have a plate of food in front of you and you just go bite after bite after bite and I kind of chew my food and take some time in between, although we might have been served the same dish, we had two very different experiences of the same meal. And it's largely because of that space in between that allows you to kind of, you know, reflect or understand a little bit better what's going on. Where if you don't have that moment, it's hard to appreciate it because there's so much, there's so much to digest. And sometimes, and I think, you know, really great musicians or dancers or, or artists also know when it's appropriate to pause or use stillness and how to use it sparingly and how powerful it can be. And I definitely, you know, when I look back at videos of myself as a young dancer or some pieces that we would do as young dancers, we're just moving constantly, you know, because it's hard for us to understand the power of not moving. But as we get older and, you know, it, it hurts a little bit more to move, we find a lot of different places to pause, you know, and making it really powerful in, the, in that way. But I think, Anthony, you also were, you know, you mentioned music as well. We all kind of use music as a way of describing silence. And I love how you were talking about, you know, the awkward silence or becoming used to whatever your pattern of noise or sound is. And I, I thought it was so interesting that, you know, people, not wanting to hear the church bells ring. Like, how interesting is that? <laughs> That's just really stupid. But yeah, I, I, I so nearly uh, filmed a piece about music as well. And I just thought, I'm going to hold off because I know you two guys are kind of professionally involved in music and you just, you know, you, you'd say something much more interesting than I would. But uh, I think with... One, something that I experience with music as um, somebody in an audience, you know, I, get, I, I love live music, whether it's jazz or classical or opera or whatever. And there is, there is this power in that, in that moment when there, isn't, there is no note being played. But equally, there is actually within the music when that space is occurring, the note is still there it's hanging, you know, that last note, it's hanging in the air. And something that um, I've noticed in the last sort of five or six years is that particularly in classical concerts and especially in opera, is when the final note is played, 
or the final note is sung, there are members of the audience who are already clapping and cheering before the note is finished. It's like they, all, they can't help themselves. You know, they want to express their gratitude. They, 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 it's a sort of instant gratification. And what I've also noticed to counterpoint that is that various conductors now, they play the last note, but they hold their hands up and they hold the baton up and everything is held in suspense. And you just wait for that final note. You know, it's still in the whole room, it's, it's there, but it's just tailing off naturally. And you know, it might be 10, even 20 seconds and you can just feel the audience they're just kind of they can't you know but it's just wonderful because you just let that you let that sound just diminish of its own accord rather than being shut off by some other noise and um yeah i think also we're talking about um creative people i think also playwrights you know use pauses very dramatically and i think in particular of Harold Pinter, who was a very popular playwright in the 60s and 70s, who had monumental pauses in his scripts, which would make the audience start to get really sort of scratchy and, oh God, is somebody going to say, have they dried up? What's going on? You know, and you get really sort of scratchy and there's this fantastic tension. And that reminds me of what happens, you know, with us socially that, you know, sometimes you're talking to people, they have to fill the void. They keep having to fill the void. They can't stand it when there's nothing being said. It's, I guess it's that idea of, yeah, the uncomfortable silence and people don't like the uncomfortable silence and we just try and fill it. But, and I guess in a way, like the modern world is where we've got so many kind of distractions that we can go to, you know, we've got our phones with news and we've got, social media, it's easy to, to, to fill it, which means that we don't get to enjoy these bits of silence. I guess thinking back to when, when we were younger and we didn't have, you know, Netflix or the internet, if the, you know, it was quite often on the weekend, it'd be a rainy day in England, as it often is, and there just wouldn't be anything on TV. So you'd have this, you'd have to fill your time with, you know, little pursuits, which means you'd be more likely to be playing with your toys or, you know, doing more, spending more time with yourself, which I guess is one of the things that people say that they, they're scared about when they come to meditate because they're, they're like, they want to they fill that uncomfortable silence that they've got with themselves. So, you know, which is why they'll, they'll get very preoccupied by the technique of meditation. So, you know, we use, we use a mantra and they'll be very, um, you know, worrying about whether they're getting it right or whether they're saying it enough. And it becomes, you know, that becomes less and less important, those kind of technicalities of it over time, because it's just being okay with whatever's there, which I think, you know, like your example of the audience, it's, it's with us as public speakers, as we're, we're teachers, especially when you're teaching someone something, it's great to pause and let something sink in. But we don't want to be you know, people to think that we we're lost for words, so we'll end up just plowing on. But, you know, to convey, you know, same with the music, to convey meaning, if you say something very meaningful, it's great to pause and let it sink in. Otherwise, you, you kind of, you cheat that point of its true value because you, you're on to the next one. So, yeah, just the more you think about it in every area of life, that idea of being on, being off, being on, being off, is very important and I guess we by meditating and reducing our stress levels we're more comfortable in those situations and we're not trying to get to the next thing the whole time yeah I definitely you know as a choreographer when I was in the car or when I was commuting because I was doing a lot of choreography at one time I was constantly on the search for different types of music, finding the right thing for this soloist or for this group. And so I was consumed with music, especially teaching class and or taking class or being in rehearsal was always around me. And I, and I, I love music, I enjoy it. Then I noticed probably more after I started meditating that more of the car rides that I would take would become silent. And I didn't really notice 
for a while until I would put music on and I would be like, no, I actually prefer silence, you know, because it was the time away from music that allowed me to enjoy it even more. And then that started to translate into silence with other human beings. And it's interesting now to, because I'm very, I'm very comfortable in silence, even when the silence is awkward with another person. I first used to recognize, okay, this person does not enjoy that. <laughs> so engage in the banter. And now I'm like, hmm, let's see what happens if, you know, because I know it's awkward, but the awkwardness kind of falls off for me. And then I can enjoy whatever it is that's going to happen. But it's really, I wonder, because I guess maybe it's been such a long time. I wonder what it is that people are afraid of <laughs> in that silence that makes it awkward. And I want to say this, there, there's some kind of statistic where like every seven minutes in a conversation, there's a lull and there's this awkward silence. I mean, Anthony, what do you, what do you think makes it awkward? Why do we, why do people feel weird in that moment? Well, I think that's very interesting. It's a great question. Um, I think what we're demonstrating here is the, the principles of a Socratic conversation, i.e. what we're talking about follows on to something else, that we're listening to each other, we're engaging with each other. The conversation flows naturally from the point that you've made, you've now in a sense passed the ball to me, and in a moment I'll pass it back to you guys. And so often in conversations which I overhear, it's not so much a conversation as a sort of proclamation. It's like people are constantly on transmit, transmitting, but they're not on receive. You know, the receive switch is not on. You remember in the old, you know, in those old fashioned Second World War black and white movies, you had to press a switch to speak and then you had to flick the switch off in order to hear. Well, my observation is that most people have got the flick flicked on the transmit switch. They're just transmitting all the time and they're not listening. They're not even really listening to themselves. It's just kind of chatter. You know, it's noise. We live in a very noisy world. And, you know, the noise, people are not, they're allowing the noise to kind of envelop themselves or be enveloped by the noise and it kind of muffles everything. And it takes some determination to stop the noise and to start differentiating what's noise and what should be heard, what are the sounds that you actually want to pick up on. And so, you know, I think most, I think some of the lulls in the conversation are when people are waiting for the other person to stop so that I can jump in and say what I want to say. I'm not, I'm not listening to what you're saying. I'm not going to say something in response to what you've said because I've got a point that I want to make. I just want you to shut up. When you shut up, then I'm going to get it. <laughs> and you see this all the time. You see this all the time. And you see this with, particularly with news interviews where you get, particularly in the UK, you get some very aggressive news, uh, news guys, journalists, who are, who are never really listening to the answer. They're, they're just pushing in. It's almost a sort of bullying tactic. And, 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 and you get the poor, you know, the, the, the interviewee is saying, just, just hold, on a sec hold on a second, let me answer your question. Now you've asked me another question. Which question do you want me, me to answer? The first one, the second one, or the third one you've just asked? You know, you're not being given time to, to express yourself. And so yeah. I, think there's a, I think it's a nervousness. I think it's um, a lack of confidence that, you know, people have to keep doing this. It's the same, in, it's the same with social media. You know, people are constantly, <laughs> how many people actually engage with the people who are liking their posts or um, making comments? You know, don't have time for that because I just want to keep transmitting. Mm, yeah, I mean, that, that's what I found about, you know, I think Twitter. I've never really understood Twitter because it just seemed like people were just spewing for rah, 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 and no one was really engaging with much. And then at the worst end of it, it's like I've not even read 
what you've said, but I'm going to give my point, which I guess is like, like that political interview thing that you said, because, yeah, the journalist is trying to get their point across and trip them up. But then the politicians also got their briefing thing, whereas they only want to say three things and they're going to say those three things, whatever the question was, you know, that, <laughs> that brilliant politician's answer of, well, that's a great question, but I think the real question is, and then I'll just say <laughs> what, what they care about. And I guess the, one of the reasons that, you know, cause I guess we've all become more comfortable with that silence from, from meditating. And I think, it makes it easier because one of the things that I think about meditation is that it helps you stop being in your head. Cause normally we've got these stresses we might call them that just mean that you're up in your head going over those things. And because you're occupied with those things, it's hard to engage with what the other person has just said because you're like, right, I've got these hangups. I need to express these hangups. But when we have <clears throat> time in silence on our own sitting for 20 minutes, and we end up going through those things that we would, that, that are on our minds. It means that when we come to a conversation, we're not, those things aren't on our minds anymore. So then we're able to engage with, with what um, other people are saying. So I often describe it as being like, it's like free therapy. You know, you go to the, the kind of Freudian analyst who just lies you down on the couch and just says, tell me more. And you know it doesn't really say anything it just acts as a sounding board and that's what we're doing in meditation is we're allowing whatever thoughts going to come next come up and then it releases so it means that when you do go and see your friend later you're not going to bore them with all that kind of flotsam that's sitting around there you can go right i'm here i've, I've cleaned out all my boring stuff i don't have to tell you about my annoying work day i can just talk about whatever might be interesting and then when it gets to a point of silence, we can just sit and enjoy it rather than, you know, me just having to whinge about this political interview with this damn journalist, Anthony, that I had to just <laughs> sit through. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's a really interesting point, Rory, about, um, you know, that engagement. Um, yeah, I think I, th I think it's just fascinating what's what's going on at the moment. But but I think um, a lot of people are quite nervous about the idea that meditation could be seen as therapy, and I think we we tread a very careful line here. And I constantly say to people, you know, this is not therapy. I'm not a therapist, but it is a form of therapy. But it's a sort of do-it-yourself therapy. We're giving people the opportunity to reacquaint themselves with themselves, you know, reacquaint themselves with somebody that perhaps they've been ignoring for quite a while. And for some people, that's very scary. That's very scary because they've been in a state of denial and burying stuff, you know, for a long time. And, you know, I, I definitely come across some students who are taking a big, deep gulp and a big, you know, inhale of breath and they say, okay, let's do this. Because when are they going to confront this? Are they going to do it now or are they going to do it in 10 years' time? You know, and in 10 years' time, there's going to be a lot more stuff in the sack. I think the other part of that that's also really interesting that some people who are coming to Vedic meditation may have part of the misconception that it might not work or they don't have the right mind for it because they cannot silence their mind. They have these thought patterns that are constantly there and they're always racing and they may have tried to silence their mind before and it hasn't worked. So maybe this form of meditation also is not going to work. And I think it's important to make the clarification, although in our practice, through transcendence, it is possible for our thoughts to cease or the mind to become silent. And that may be delightful and delicious, which we have all experienced. However, that's not the goal either. You know, it doesn't, we're not looking to silence the mind. And I think a lot of people they are in some ways because they either 
are engaging in the world in a way where they're never silent, they never have a moment of silence. They can't find their inner silence. So they're looking for meditation to bring that. And then when they're experiencing thoughts, they're thinking, oh, I thought this was supposed to be a silent thing, you know, or many people think that we have to meditate in a place that's com completely silent or that maybe we have to cover our ears. And we all know that this technique doesn't require silence in order for it to work, that, you know, noise is not a barrier to what we do. And so what I always think is interesting too is how human beings kind of take on this backward way of getting to what it is that they want. Because we would also probably agree that when our mind is silent and free from thoughts, we are enjoying whatever that is, that experience of transcendence and touching the part within us, that absolute that's within everybody. And that's obviously a great feeling. And so then it becomes, okay, then in order to get that feeling, I have to silence my mind, you know, which seems logical, but we all know the more you try to silence your mind, the harder that is to do, you know, you're, you're, you're creating this obstacle that's actually inhibiting the actual thing that you're, you're wanting to do. And so what I love so much about our technique is the mechanism that we use with the Bija Mantra that does all the work for us, but along with the other part of the attitude that's necessary that if, if our mind falls silent, great. If it doesn't, great. If there's chatter, great. You know, all of that, it's, it's, it's par for the course. I think it's important just to note that we're, we're not of the opinion of silence the mind. That's what we've got to do. It's a byproduct yeah. of what we're doing. And yeah, thoughts are, thoughts are completely fine. And, you know, silence may come and silence may not come. That's, that's not the point yeah. of it. I think, I think that's one of the, the biggest um, mistakes people make in, in, in their understanding of meditation. It's one of the easiest things to break, like in, in the first couple of days of the course is that silence, like you say, is a, is, a, is a product of this. It's not the process. You're not going, right, where's the off button? It's about being okay with what, whatever's going on. And I think what we're doing is we're silencing our, our anxiety. And there's a lot of performance anxiety around meditation itself. I remember just going, oh, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? My teacher's basically just laughing because it's just you need to get rid of all that, all that stuff. Um, but I had an interesting one the other day where I was giving a, um, a guided meditation over Zoom to, to my friend who does like a co-working space that she's doing online. And it was about, you know, the power of rest and the power of silence. And we have a, we have a construction site next to our house at the moment. And, you know, I'm giving this be calm all this talk and then these big power drills come on and you know in the old days I'd be like oh my god this is typical my my presentation's been ruined but now it's more like well that's great that's just an example of that's illustrating my point that we live in this crazy noisy world and you know a lot of people on the call had kids running around you know in lockdown there's a lot of people, people doing the homeschooling which is you know <laughs> A big, a big kind of barrier to, to silence. But like you said, it's not about finding, you know, zero decibels. It's about finding your state of calm within that mayhem. And, and I always say that, you know, even if I had my kind of ideal restful state on a, on a paradise island with two palm trees and a, and a hammock, there would be some bird of paradise just squawking <laughs> in my ear constantly. Um, and it's this idea that, yeah, we don't, I love the idea that we don't need silence and it's about finding that, that place of silence within. And it's the same thing that, you know, you know, sports people can get on the field where you might be like the goal kicker taking a penalty in a, in a rugby match and there's 80,000 fans screaming at you to miss it. And you can be the one who goes, right, I'm going to find this calm. And I, what I love about meditation is that 
it's going to help you find that calm, whatever your, your lifestyle is, whether it's like a high, high grade sports person or, you know, a, a busy mum at home or like an exec or a, uh, an actor or whatever it might be. It's going to help you find that silence that's appropriate for wherever you are and means that you don't have to go on the 10 day silent retreat. Cause I think that's the other thing people go, right. I've never done any meditation. I need to do something. What's the most powerful thing I can do. I'm going to do this extremely extreme 10 days of silence. And then when they come out of that, the passion thing, it's too, that's too hardcore because then they're expected to meditate an hour in the morning, an hour and in the evening. And, you know, as we know in, in our technique, that's more of a, a monk's practice, a monastic discipline, which is, is too extreme. If you, if you just want to experience your life in a more full and relaxing and an engaged way, then you don't need this monk's practice of complete austerity. You just want this much more manageable practice that we do in Vedic of 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, where it's rather than this extreme coming away from the world, it's more you're just dipping into it so that you're never too far from it. So it's like rest, back, rest, back, not all the rest in the world and then never do it again. It's much more mm. designed to fit into our normal lives. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, that's such a great point, Rory. You know, as, as we've all been taught, it's, it's a householder's tradition you know it's, it's designed for people like us people who have families and relationships and jobs and are out there in the world it's not a monastic practice you know i mean if you want to use vedic meditation in a monastic way that's your choice but it's not designed for that and i think also the other point um, that i i make to students is that you know the mind is is designed to have content you know the mind always has content and even, even when we're meditating, it has content. But then there's this absolutely fascinating moment, which some people who don't meditate occasionally have access to, but we as Vedic meditators have constant access to, but don't always get there, is that moment where we transcend thought, where we reach that fourth state of consciousness. And... As you were saying, Derek, you know, that's not the objective. That's not what we're aiming for. It may happen. It may not. Maybe we dip into it for a millisecond or many milliseconds. It doesn't matter because ultimately the content of the meditation is not that important, which, of course, is a very hard thing to hear when you're a new student. You think, well, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm practicing my 20 minutes. What do you mean the content of my meditation isn't important? Well, when they realize that actually it's the other 23 hours and 20 minutes of the day, that's the important bit. That's where we want to have the fullest, most expansive uh, interaction and connection. That, yeah, we do the 20 minutes, but it's what's coming out of the 20 minutes, how we actually engage, how we use those 20 minutes, those two 20 minute sessions to connect and to, to, to get out there and enjoy ourselves and to evolve. That's where the true evolution takes place, not within the meditation. It's when we start to get out of the meditation and when we realize in those very exciting early days when we've been putting in lots of meditation, that the eyes open experience is not so different from the eyes closed experience. Oh. And you start to notice something really interesting. And that's a topic for another day, perhaps. But yeah. Yeah, that's when you're starting to really take off. You know, when we talk about the scientific as aspects of meditation, we say when you, you let your um, mind relax, it allows all these um, synaptic connections to fire between the hemispheres, which means you have your logical left brain stuff with your creative right brain stuff. And this happens not just through meditation, like with the example of Newton, he's sitting under the tree, but that's like, you can get this from, if you've got some problem you're working over, you can go for a, a walk along the beach if you're around here, or you know, um, around the cricket pitch in, in Anthony's idyllic English scene, which I love. Um, and you know, people can get this, this, this calmness and this relaxation in any different way but what's good about meditation is it's a specifically designed way that you can do when you don't have a nice apple tree in an orchard 
to sit in. But I think the other point about Newton that people were mentioning at the beginning of lockdown was that he he was there and he couldn't be in his lab because it was during one of the plague um, shutdowns of London. So he had to be, you know, be in isolation. And that's a great um, thing that we can get, you know, from these lockdown, lockdown times is enforced silence because we can't go and socialize. Hmm. That was the point I was really sort of making in, in, in my piece that, you know, this is a great moment to do a little bit of work on ourselves. Um, for those people who don't meditate, you know, that, that we don't have the usual clamor and we don't have the usual stimuli around us. And it's what you were talking about, Derek, you know, the stimulus and the response. You know, we have, a, we have the opportunity of not immediately responding to that stimulus, that we can take time, that we can consider our response. And that might be a couple of moments. It could be a couple of hours. It could be a couple of days. It could be a couple of years. You know, but when it's appropriate, we'll give it. And, um, you know, it's just, just getting away from this, this idea that we have to fill the void all the time you know, that, that the void is sometimes where great things happen, as Rory was saying, you know, sitting under the apple tree, seemingly doing nothing. And there is a strong indication from nature, nature that's always providing us with the examples. If we choose to recognize them, there's the apple that falls out of the tree. Now I understand what's going on. Gravity. Yeah, it's beautiful. And we have to be leave the silence. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> okay, thanks for sticking around till the end. Each episode, we offer a takeaway of an exercise you can do at home to start to apply this knowledge to your own life. In this episode, we were talking about silence and each of us shared a story which showed what silence meant to us. This week, as you go about your normal life, we invite you to find a moment to be silent. Do something in silence when you'd normally have music or the radio on, working out, driving the car, taking the bus. Or alternatively, sit in silence with someone for five minutes. Tell them what you're doing, of course, but then see what it's like not to say anything. If you're happy to share your stories, we'd love to have you join the conversation. Please send them through to us or post them on social media with the hashtag, The Vedic Conversation, and we'll share some in future episodes.